Hi there, it's Tracy, and I have a special bonus episode for you today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that season five of the show will be launching soon in the new year. Season five will be Lost and Found, stories about the people and things we've lost and the journey to reclaim and rebuild the broken pieces. If you have a story to share, contact us at stories at vietnameseboatpeople.org. Also, we just launched a new initiative called VBP Journeys. It's a digital space where you can share photos and memories of your family's diaspora story. This project is still in the prototype stage, so be sure to check it out and give us feedback. Go to www.vietnameseboatpeople.org forward slash journeys. In this bonus episode, we have a pod swap with our friends from Dear Asian Americans, hosted by Jerry Wan. This podcast brings on guests from diverse backgrounds and career paths to celebrate, support, and inspire the Asian American community. We're sharing with you episode 102 of Dear Asian Americans with Lisa Tran, owner of Tan Tan Foods. Lisa's parents fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and successfully made it to the Indonesian refugee camp where Lisa was born. In 1981, they moved to Oregon and over the years started a family business, Tan Tan Cafe and Delicatessen, which became a local favorite for the community in Beaverton, Oregon. In 2017, they introduced a trio of their most popular house sauces for home cooks, and Lisa then began to think about the evolution of their family business. Lisa talks about growing up straddling two cultures, her love for the family restaurant, and how she expanded it into what it is today. Take a listen. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dear Asian Americans. I am Tiffany Huang, your host for the month of March, and I want to welcome you to our show. March is Women's History Month, and this month we will be sharing stories of exemplary Asian American women to not only celebrate them, but to inspire us all. Today, I'm excited to welcome Lisa Tran, who in 2017 launched Tan Tan Sauces, which features vegan, gluten-free Vietnamese sauces. Lisa has begun to make an indelible mark in the food space, contributing to elevating Southeast Asian food culture, and we are so excited to have her on the show. So, hey, Lisa, how are you doing? Hi, Tiff. I'm doing good. How are you? Good. We've had some technical difficulties. I feel like we went through a battle, and now we're finally recording, so I feel good. (laughs) I'm happy to be here. We survived together. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I think your story is such an important story because many people will resonate with your parents being refugees from Vietnam. But I think also the other part of it, which ties into Women's History Month, is just your specific journey as a female entrepreneur and building a business based off of the cafe and delicatessen that your parents started over 20 years ago. We're really excited to hear that story. And You know, what we would love and what we normally do on the show is to actually have you start from from your parents beginning. Like, how did the Tran family end up coming over to America? So um, my parents met actually on their very first failed escape after Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese Army. Um, My mom at the time was a elementary school principal and my dad was months away from becoming a priest he was a seminarian and uh when the northern vietnamese came in they shut down all of the schools and um you know there was either all the people who were educated all the people who had religious affiliations they were put in what the vietnamese called it um re-education camps and um so the only other way to leave this was to plan escape so my parents were part of a big wave of vietnamese people who left and they were called the boat people my dad and his cousin together um tried to plan a Uh, escape. And it turned out that my mom was on that same boat with him. Uh, They left in the middle of the night in sometime in 1976. And um, they got caught by the Vietnamese army. And my mom couldn't swim. So she stayed on the boat. But my dad swam away. And my dad left and my mom was actually put in jail. 
um, when she came out about 10, 10 days later, she had my dad's sweater. It was a sweater jacket that she had and she asked and, um, asked who it belonged to. And it turned out that it belonged to Vin Tran, my dad. And at the time my dad was staying with a cousin of his that happened to live near where my mom's family lived. And she went over to return his jacket and, my dad fell in love with her <laughs> and the rest oh my is history. Um, yeah. So my mom was chubby. She likes to talk about how chubby she was. And my dad <laughs> loves how chubby she was because in Vietnam, you know, uh, wealth is kind of a sign of chubbiness or chubbiness is a sign of wealth and prosperity. Yeah. So my mo- my mom was, um, was pretty chubby <laughs> and my dad was taken <laughs> with her. So that's that's how they began their romance. I love that. So they began their romance and then was it shortly thereafter they they tried to escape again? Yeah so within about three more months um, my dad actually asked um, for my aunt's uh, blessing to be engaged to my mom so that they could travel together and um, my dad at the same time was organizing another escape escape boat and he brought along his younger brother and his younger sister. And my mom brought along her younger sister. And this time they were successful. Um, there were, I want to say there were 12, 12 of them on a boat. And they were at sea for almost two weeks. But before that, about three days into their journey, it was a little fishing boat in the open ocean they got um, onboarded by Thai pirates, and the Thai pirates took all the food that they had, whatever little money or gold they had, and then they beat up um, and assaulted the women and the men on board, and it was just terrible, and they were just kind of cast out in the open ocean with no power. They took their little motor um, and they just kind of relied on prayer. I, you know how I mentioned my dad was months away from becoming a priest. So he was really, um, he really, really leaned on his religion and led the group in prayer and their prayers were answered. A few days later, there was a big, uh, fisherman from Thailand that came and actually towed their little boat fed them, gave them water, and towed them to an island in Thailand. So. Oh, my gosh. What a harrowing journey. Yeah. And and is this something that over the years you've learned piece by piece from your parents? Like, were they very open about the journey with you guys? Because I know a lot of times it's trauma sometimes that doesn't want to be revisited. Mm-hmm. They've always told us that – they were refugees in Vietnamese. It's a word called the yuk bing, which means to be a refugee, to leave your country and be a refugee. But I never knew the details of what exactly happened until very recently, um, where I had a chance to sit down. And I think my parents felt that I was old enough to be responsible with the information that they gave me and to be able to receive it in a respectful way. Um, I just didn't know that the women on the boat were raped and I didn't know that the men were beaten so badly. I just knew that they were in a little fishing boat cast away on a open ocean. And I just thought it was just a little merry way of arriving to, you know, the refugee camp. But a lot of things happened during that trip and, you know, they didn't know if they were going to die, but looking back, They risked death. They risked and sacrificed what life or what little life they had left in Vietnam because they didn't want to live in an oppressive Vietnam. They didn't want to live in a country where they weren't free to be educated. They weren't free to learn more and that they wanted their own children to have an opportunity to also achieve accomplishments. But under communist rule, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, and I'm so glad they they ended up finally, the prayers were answered, and they ended up safe. So they they docked in Thailand, you said, Mm -hmm. Um, and then how long were they there? So Thailand's made of 
of a lot of islands. So the island that they were on happened to be a triage point to figure out from Thailand which refugee mm-hmm. camp they would go to. At the time, there were refugee camps in um in other islands of Thailand, but also in Malaysia and Singapore, et cetera. And they happened to be triaged into Indonesia. So they were in Thailand for almost six months before they wow. went to Indonesia. And when they arrived in Indonesia, they arrived at a camp called Galang. And it actually happened to be the biggest Vietnamese refugee camp Um, during that time and now you can go back to Indonesia and visit that camp they've memorialized it and turned it into kind of a museum of sorts so well that's amazing have you guys had a chance to do that as a family we have not and um, my parents just haven't my my dad especially has a lot of conflicting feelings about that I think Mm -hmm. someday imagine he will want to go but right now, I think the wounds are a little bit too fresh still. Yeah, I, I'm sure. And I think, you know, a product of being in the Asian American culture is just also that there is still that mental health stigma, um, particularly with males. And, you know, what do they do with that trauma? What do they do with that pain if they don't talk about it and talk mm-hmm. through it? So that's absolutely understandable. Um, I understand that you, though, were born in a Cambodian refugee camp. Is that correct? No, I was born in it. Oh, no. Indonesian. In the Indonesian. Oh, yeah. Indonesian one. So, okay. it, was so it was there. Born, yep. I was born in Galang camp. And it okay. was, um, people ask if I have dual citizenship. And I say no. I was <laughs> only two months old when we were sponsored to the States. So I was, um, I was born there. I have a birth certificate there that's really fun to look at. And it's, um, yeah, my parents built a life for themselves there. They were there for nearly five years because you have to keep in mind back in when they arrived in the refugee camp, it was in early 77 and there wasn't any internet. There wasn't any cell phones or anything like that. So they're really at the same time, my mom's sisters and my dad's other siblings also were trying to escape. Um, so there was no way of keeping track of where everybody was. Um, letters, not having any money to send mail or even knowing which addresses to send or which camps to go to. It was really just relayed on word of mouth. Like if somebody happened to be triaged um, onto your island, but they happen to be on the same boat as a cousin or another family member, then messages could be passed along. But other than that, it was really just kind of a, like a needle in a haystack type of situation. Yeah, um, that's crazy. Also, just like the, the loss of all that connection you have too, because family is such an important part of our culture. Um, but you were born there and I understand you, you do have siblings as well? I do have siblings. I was the first born, and um, when we arrived in America in 1981, my brother was born in 1982, so my younger brother and I are 16 months apart. Almost Irish twins. Almost. (laughs) And my parents always like to say, you know, my brother John has the chance to be the president of the United States someday. That was something that they always talked about because he was born in the States. Yeah. It was just yeah. I mean, that's part of the American dream, right? I mean, look at us now. We have a VP of Asian American descent. Um, So that's (laughs) something I didn't know I was going to see in my history. So anything is really possible. Everything is possible. Yeah, and then you guys originally did you land right away in Beaverton, Oregon? So we when you were sponsored over. Yeah, so we landed in a suburb that's very close to Beaverton called Tigard. And it was um, through a church that my aunt had been a part of when she was here on a student visa. And they reconnected in Tigard. And so that's why we went to Tigard. And um, we were sponsored by an American family, the Lieberts, who have been such a foundational part of our um, kind of assimilation into American culture. I grew up calling them my grandma and grandpa because my paternal grandparents were still in Vietnam and my parents called them mom and dad. We 
they taught us all the different traditions. And um, I remember one of my first meals eating with them that I remembered was they put cheddar cheese on broccoli. And I never <laughs> had that before. <laughs> and that was so interesting. I still personally have never had that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a classic American thing to have, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because my parents were so rooted in their culture and they're so proud to be Vietnamese, but yet my parents were also very open to trying new things and, um, you know, taking us kids out to go see a movie when we could afford it to, or, you know, enrolling us kids in swimming lessons or piano lessons, yeah. things that we wasn't really ingrained part of our our childhood growing up in in Vietnam, possibly, you know, these are opportunities yeah. that grandma and grandpa Lieberts had suggested to them. And they just said yes to everything, which is really wonderful. Oh, my God, that is Yeah, that is wonderful, because it's you're maintaining your culture, but you're also gaining from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, in my own personal experience, um, not sure about you, but like language for me was lost. Um, I, I knew it when I was, you know, maybe three, four, five. And by the time I went to grade school, it was gone. And, you know, I've asked my mom about that. You know, why, 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 what happened? Why did we do that? And she was like, oh, you know, because we were an American. I thought we should be American. But it is something, you know, I personally deeply regret. And, um, you know, if I had my time again, I, I would have loved to remain bilingual, but but I didn't, you know, but it's great that you guys, you know, kind of had that intersection of both cultures and were able to maintain both of them. Yeah. And that's opposite. Your childhood growing up was a little bit opposite of mine because my parents really wanted us to speak Vietnamese at home and they still continue to ask us to respectfully speak Vietnamese at home. And growing up, my parents, especially my mom would say, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, I feel left out. How am I supposed to know if you are talking behind my back or not? So you need to really speak Vietnamese. So honestly, like, I still consider English my second language. I think in Vietnamese, a lot of times words will come to me and it's so hard for me to describe it or articulate it in English because it comes to me in Vietnamese first. I went to ESL up until I was in second grade. (laughs) I loved it. And um, even now to this day, I feel like, you know, I always hear my parents telling me no matter how great of, um, uh, you know, a culture assimilation that you get and how no matter what clothes you wear or how well you speak English, you will always have your brown eyes. You will always have Mm -hmm. your creamy skin. You will always be, you know, um, like your black hair, you will always be Vietnamese. And so they've really taught me and my siblings at a young age to be really, really proud of being Vietnamese. And it, you know, it hasn't always been easy, but looking back, I'm so incredibly grateful and thankful that they gave us that opportunity and kind of pushed us towards being more Vietnamese and accepting. That is Really so beautiful because, you know, I think back in my past and part of why I've become so entrenched now in, in AAPI culture is because I never, I never, I never got that dialogue. You know, I never actually felt comfortable in my own skin or felt, um, or if I felt beautiful because I think, you know, we, we're probably around the same age, but the standard of beauty because of representation was just so different back then. And I'm, I'm personally really grateful now that I have children that there are more people like us that they can see in the mainstream media, but it was few and far between when we were growing up. Um, and I already have like a really Caucasian name. I have like Tiffany, right? Cause I'm <laughs> a girl of the eighties. Um, but you know, it's, it's, you know, like who, who, who did I have to be a model, you know? And, and I certainly did not get that perspective from my parents. So I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that, that you, you definitely got that love on your side. Um, it's really beautiful, really beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, my yeah. name is actually pretty interesting too, because my Vietnamese name is Tao 
It's spelled T H A O mm-hmm. and it means obedient. It was a very popular Vietnamese name in the 80s. For I know both, a few Taos. Yeah, for both <laughs> boys and girls. And um, I remember very distinctly in second grade, my teacher had had told me maybe you should consider having an English name or adopting an English name because it would be easier to pronounce. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming home and just having just, you know, at seven years old, just feeling unsure, or just not really understanding the big feelings yeah. that I had at the time. But I, what I remember distinctly from it is that feeling of embarrassment and mm-hmm. that feeling of just shame possibly, but also in a way feeling what is wrong with my name and then subsequently what is wrong with me. And then right. my best friend in second grade, her name was Lisa. And so I wanted my name to be Lisa. And so I remember coming back to school and telling my parents, I really want my name to be Lisa. And then my parents put in motion at that time, we had become naturalized citizens. My parents had mm-hmm. become naturalized citizens and my brother and I had too. And so when they asked my brother, his Vietnamese name is Yao, G-I-A-O. They were saying, well, maybe you should have your your American name to be George. And he was like, no, I want it to be John. So we kind of, us kids got to choose our names, our English yeah. names. And it's just one of those things. I mean, I love my name. I answer to Lisa. My parents call me Lisa. Um, but, you know, I have a very special connection to Tao and a very special connection to that time in my life where in I just really considered myself to be Viet, more Vietnamese than American. And I, yeah. I feel like I'm going back into that where I'm owning my name a little bit more mm-hmm. and just, you know, I am because I kept my Tao as my middle name. Yeah. So I just feel like I own it a little bit more and I'm proud of it. I mean, I think it makes sense because that's the intersection of, you know, what you're doing with your life's work as well, um, which is amplifying the Southeast Asian culture. Um, if we go back a little bit to, you know, when your parents were in the refugee camp, because there were some some roots of entrepreneurial spirit while they were there. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> so my mom... Um, just, she's always loved food. She's always loved cooking. Um, and so one of the more, I think all of us can relate to when we go on vacations or when we go somewhere, we really remember the food that we eat and especially being homesick in a kind of precarious situation where you don't know where you're going to be the next day or how long you'll be at the camp. You kind of really long for the cuisine that you grew up with and the flavors that Mm -hmm. are comforting. Um, There was a little commissary run by a Chinese family who was there um, to buy ingredients. They didn't have all the ingredients like fish sauce, et cetera, but they had some Um, keep in mind, my parents had been robbed. They had no money. So my dad, he helped to build the church that was on the island, but he would also, um, he was kind of a carpenter, a craftsman, and he would carve Mm -hmm. figurines out of wood and bark and also like the leftover plywood that they had. And he would sell those to the people on the island and that what little money they had, they would buy the cheapest ingredient that they had had in the commissary, which was rice flour, any kind of grain. And my dad would buy that and my mom would kind of uh, grind it down and she would fry them and make little um, cookies. They're almost kind of like, I always want to say they're like really thin wafers almost. And they're just mm-hmm. a touch sweet, not super sweet. But my dad would actually make her these little molds where she would press them together and have little designs on them. And she would sell them in a little bag of like four or five. And then that is so cool. (laughs) Yeah. And whatever (laughs) money she made from that, she would use that money to go buy the ingredients to then go back and try to replicate sauces and things that could amplify, you know, the rations that they gave out to the refugees. Um, and so that was very, very entrepreneurial 
of them. Yeah. It's kind of a uh, full circle too, because I mean, obviously when, when they first arrived in America, they, you know, Tan Tan Cafe and Delicatessen is like over 20 years old, but they didn't start out doing that when they came over initially, right? No, because our families, my mom's family and my dad's family were both, um, they valued education quite a lot. Mm-hmm. My mom would like to tell stories how when they took the national test, the test scores would be announced on the radio. And if your name was towards the bottom, you would bring shame upon your family. Oh, of course, of um, course. <laughs> and so my mom and her sisters, she was one of eight sisters. They often were just so focused on school that education was everything. And that was a big mm-hmm. motivation as to why they wanted to escape Vietnam. And my dad's family was not as wealthy as my mom's, but they were very highly political and also educational. Um, My dad felt a calling to go into seminary school. And in seminary school, he studied Latin. He studied philosophy. He studied all these subjects that are very highly intellectual, but also had no real translation into um, kind of a fast paying job in America. Um, right. And so when they arrived in America, my mom um, took ESL classes. She worked as a seamstress and then took care of my brother and I. My dad would wash dishes at a local cafe, but then also work, get work from the church as a landscaper and mow people's lawns. And his first question was always, well, what's the easiest um, education so that I could graduate and get a job really quick. And they told him that being a machinist would be a really good job. You only need an associate's degree. I think it's an 18 month program. Um, And he took night classes and he graduated and was a machinist. And at the time, Boeing, the big airplane company Mm -hmm. had a big uh, employment boom in Portland for their plant in Portland. So my dad, um, went to work at Boeing in Portland and he was there for close to 37 years and he retired. And upon retirement, he held a couple patents actually for tools that he had designed um, working at Boeing. And then my mom went to a temp agency and one of the companies that was hiring through the temp agency happened to be Nike. And so my mom went to work at the Nike in-house manufacturing, uh, factory for years and years and years. And it just has kind of grown and they were just very lucky. um... Yeah, and it's crazy that they are work- they they worked for such quintessential American companies as well. <laughs> yeah, you know. But I-, I love that story too because it is such a a demonstration of like grit, right? In terms of like they are just going to do whatever they need to do to make it work for their family and to yeah. provide for you guys. And I think it's just beautiful, like what all of our parents' generations did for us because in large, in in large part, they were really just trying to survive, right? They were immigrants of this country. They couldn't necessarily speak the language. I I can't even imagine what that mental load was, you know? And then you think about all the resources we have now, like we have access to mental health care. We have access to health care, all this stuff. And they were just doing it all. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, going through all of that trauma and then being in a country where you Mm -hmm. don't know the language you are discriminated against because yeah. of, you know, all the conflict surrounding, you know, the political, the plot politics of the Vietnam war. Um, right. But also, you know, their pride must have taken such a hit from, you know, being in such elevated spaces in their community and then having to go down a couple rungs to, mm-hmm. you know, really work with their hands and, I mean, just thinking back, it's just I'm so incredibly proud of my parents for what they did because what motivated them was that they sacrificed this for their kids and that they put all of their hopes and dreams into creating this better life for me and my siblings at the expense of their hard work. And, um, you know, it was pressure also 
not only pride, but right. pressure growing up and being told all of this stuff, especially when we did something wrong in their eyes mm-hmm. or we got in trouble. It's like, I didn't sacrifice this to come over here to, you know, have you do this. <laughs> yeah. It's all of this guilt and all of, there's a lot of big emotions. Yeah. And you're a mom also. And I just feel like some of that stuff, you actually can't even put yourself in their shoes until you actually become a parent. So hearing that type of stuff when you're 12, 15, 17, you're just flippant. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you don't really feel the weight of what that means, like what that sacrifice is. Um, and I, I, I've personally felt that as well, just being on my own personal journey as a parent. Um, but I think it's also like beautiful that while on their journey, you know, they ended up working for these quintessential American companies. They then, they then became, they came full circle and then started their own business um, as entrepreneurs that was linked to food, which is, you know, quite the ex- same experience that they had in the refugee camp. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah. So my parents, um, my mom especially has always been a very, very good cook. Um, we, didn't indulge in going out to eat very often as a lot of other immigrant families. We were also very, very (laughs) frugal. Um, And my mom would always say, well, I can make it better at home. So what she would do is, you know, if there was like this salted pepper calamari dish that we went to, um, that was so famous. Yeah. My mom would come home and she would make it in Um, like we love chocolate chip cookies when we were kids and my mom would say, I can make this. So, I mean, if you think back in the day, there were no recipe, internet recipe Mm -hmm. sites. It was cutting out newspaper recipes that she found and, or like the back of, you know, Nestle Toll House, uh, chocolate chip (laughs) bags. And she would make it for us and just, you know, everything she thought people could do. She wanted to be able to do it in a in a better, less expensive way, but also be able to give that experience to us kids. And um, yeah. my mom ended up being diagnosed with breast cancer. So she uh, retired from Nike early. And then my dad, throughout working at Boeing, Boeing is a wonderful company. They have amazing benefits. Um, it's unionized. So my dad was a big member of the union, but because it's a unionized um, employment structure, there's union contracts that need to be negotiated every few years. So every three years or so, there'd be mass layoffs because of mm-hmm. the union not being able to meet with the negotiations at Boeing. And so, you know, as an immigrant family, um, insecurity, whether it be food insecurity, whether it be you know, like career insecurity, wealth insecurity, whatever was um, not okay. So my parents were always looking for something else to do because at this time my mom was, um, was in remission from breast cancer Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just looking for something else to do. And my aunt and uncle have been making hams and pâtés, Vietnamese hams and pâtés and Vietnamese beef meatballs up in Vancouver, Canada for a few years. And they developed quite a following because every time we went to go visit them up in Canada, we would bring back these hams and meatballs and my parents would sell it to their friends or, you know, share it with family. Um, And so pretty soon we had a lot of people from here in the Pacific Northwest driving up to Vancouver to buy all of these hams. And then there was rumblings of mad cow disease and the borders shut down. So we couldn't import any um, meat from Canada. So that cut off a huge business arm of my aunt and uncle. And um, they came down and they asked my parents if they were interested in starting this uh, this arm of, um, you know, hams and Vietnamese pâtés down here in Beaverton. Yeah. And being yes people, my parents just said, why not? Let's just see how it goes. We opened um, in 1997, I believe. It was 1996. I can't, I can't do math. <laughs> um, they opened the, the, it wasn't a restaurant. It was basically a deli counter. We had a mm-hmm. wide array of hams that we could slice by the pound. 
you could buy house made mayonnaise and house made pates and beef meatballs. We had little scoops. So it looked like a meat counter at the supermarket. And yeah. on the side, my mom would make little cakes and sticky rice and buns just to sell on the side. And we had two tables, I remember, two tables with two chairs on each side. So four people max. And I remember my mom would grumble and say, why are those people just buying a coffee and why are they just sitting there? Why don't they go? <laughs> because she wanted it to be turned over. To turn the table, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we would serve things like the Vietnamese banh mi where we could showcase mm-hmm. our hams and our pate. And we had a little noodle soup that would showcase our broth and the beef meatballs. And people could just order it there and just eat it there. But my mom um, gradually brought in more tables and pretty soon the little um, deli just kind of went away and we just kept on adding more tables. And at the time, because it was a deli, we were under the umbrella of the agriculture department of agriculture and Mm -hmm. um, our department of agriculture representative came and told us that they can no longer inspect us anymore and that they were transferring us over to the health department because we're no longer a deli. We are a full-blown dine-in restaurant. (laughs) So um, when my parents got that news, they said, okay, let's do a little mini remodel. Let's take Mm -hmm. away this, this deli case. And then we started serving things like pho and we started, um, making steamed buns and having a fresh steamer there. My mom brought in a dessert case and she started making a variety of desserts and it just has kind of um, kept up through the years. That is amazing for, for the listeners. It's about 6 PM on West coast. So Lisa's just making me super hungry. (laughs) Well, you know, I've been close for a remodel for four months now. So I'm, craving Tian Tian very much. So So has it been the same location all these years and you're you're now doing a second remodel? Yeah, so it's been at the Beaver downtown Beaverton location. Downtown Beaverton are uh, it's a little suburb outside of Portland. We're about ten minutes away from downtown Portland. Um mm-hmm. Beaver we grew up in Beaverton. Um, it happens to be the most diverse city in the whole state of Oregon, which we're so proud to be of this community. Yeah. And um, yeah, we've just been here uh, for 22 years now. We just celebrated our 22nd birthday in December. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank and, you. and your mom is also still cancer free as well. Um, so she had just gotten um, diagnosed with breast cancer for the third time. Oh, um, no, I'm so sorry. It's okay. So the remodel this time has actually been a blessing where she really so she is able relax. to take, yeah, take the rest and just mm-hmm. relax. Um, we did have a little bit of, um, you know, working with my mom uh, and I, we're very, I think we're both very introverted but we're not mm-hmm. shy about our feelings. Like we might not say very much, but when we do have feelings, it's pretty big feelings. Yeah, um, so, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I kind of ran, I, I ran the restaurant with my mom. I was in high school at the time. A restaurant was right across from the high school and I would just go to school. My parents would take us to the restaurant early in the morning, help set up. And then my brother and I would walk across the street to go to school. After school, we'd walk across the street back, do our homework. We had an upstairs with a bunk bed and we would take naps or whatnot upstairs. So really like we just spent a lot of time in the restaurant. And then um, when I graduated, you know, it just became a thing where I was supposed to go to med school. So I needed to learn pre-med. I needed to go to school for pre-med. Um, and it wasn't, and it wasn't something that it was supposed to be a legacy of a restaurant being passed on to the kids. It was always like, I don't want you to work at the restaurant. We are doing this for now so that we yeah. can afford to send you to college. Um, I ended up getting a scholarship going to Portland State, which is not that far away. And um, yeah, I tried to get into pre med. I forced my brain into science and (laughs) organic chemistry and physics and that just did not work but I still try to keep keep at it um and I did not get into med school big surprise I applied two times I didn't get in 
my brain wasn't working that way. And I just said, you know, I love working at the restaurant. I love like, I love seeing the customers. I grew up like wanting to run my own store. I grew up wanting to have a restaurant on my own. Like I really want to stay here. And then, so my mom's next step was saying, well, we don't want you to, you know, to not go to school anymore and just have this one little tiny restaurant we're going to open up another location for you. And so we ended Mm -hmm. up opening a location in Vancouver, Washington. So just across the river in Washington state. And I ran that restaurant up in Vancouver, Washington for 10 years. And my mom ran the restaurant in Beaverton. And so I really hit the ground running when we opened the Vancouver Mm -hmm. location and learned important things like inventory and uh, QuickBooks and bookkeeping, bookkeeping things that, you know, my mom just kind of loosely did in a notebook because, you know, <laughs> our business experience is just running the businesses on our own and yeah. just doing it day by day. And it was a steady income. It was a paycheck every day. And that was just something that my parents were very secure in, just having an income coming in every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. At that time, my dad was back at Boeing, and it was really just my mom and I. My brother mm-hmm. helped, my siblings helped, but, you know, it was always encouraging them to go to school. They were just, well, Lisa can't go to school anymore. She's not smart <laughs> enough. So um, that's, <gasps> that's why she has true. other restaurants. <laughs> That's not true. I, I, I can relate to your experience because I um, went to UCLA and um, declared as an economics major, but I probably had the same experience as you where I was like, this is not good for my brain. Like, <laughs> it's just not clicking for whatever reason. And it's really funny because, you know, I, I do finance stuff for my job now and I, I work with data. I work with numbers. I work with analytics, but for whatever reason, it was so dry to me. And I was like, I can't, I cannot fathom doing this. Yeah, I ended I just, up, I ended up being a classical civilizations major, which is the farthest thing from it. But <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Like I did not like school at all. The aspects that I really did like about college was the activities that I did, I ha- mm-hmm. I joined the pre-med, Portland Pre-Med Society, and then I actually became president of the Pre-Med Society, and I really loved organizing the events. I re- really yeah. loved doing the outreach. <laughs> I joined, you know, VSA, the Vietnamese Student Association, and was really involved with the activities and extracurriculars at yeah. school, but not necessarily <laughs> not so much the, the curriculum. The curriculum. <laughs> no. So you, so you ran that restaurant for 10 years and then how did that parlay into sauces? So, um, I became pregnant. Well, first, Mm -hmm. before I became pregnant, I got married (laughs) and um, met your husband. (laughs) Yes. I met my husband. So my husband and I were running the restaurant and, you know, if for those who have never worked in a restaurant or, um, I would say maybe a family restaurant, it's grueling hours, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We would work 14, 16 hours a day. We were the first ones there, the last ones out. And on top of that, you know, picking up produce, picking up supplies and these big heavy cars and loading, it was hard work. Um, And then when I, when we got pregnant, it turned out that we found out we were having twins. So not only was having (laughs) one child, you know, scary enough, we yeah. found out we were having two. So we thought maybe one child might be manageable with a restaurant. My husband had all these ideas of that he would be sitting down and he could rock the little um, sleeper with one foot and like do paperwork <laughs> with the other, but um, that did not happen. And so my husband and I really started to talk about, you know, as children, because he grew up with a business family too. His family actually had the very first Vietnamese a grocery store here in Portland. So he oh, wow. grew up in, you know, a very entrepreneurial family as well. And, you know, not wanting our kids to be having absent parents, we really wanted to have more of a mm-hmm. uh, more straightforward, normal, quote unquote, normal childhood. Um, and so we started thinking about what can we do that would give us time to spend with our family and our kids. And Mm -hmm. we had an idea to do an app because at the time it seems like everybody had an app 
And we thought, well, we have a good idea for an app. So let's figure out how we can do a business plan for this. So I went to our local SBDC, which is like the small business um, sector. And I found a flyer that said, getting your recipe to market. Do you have a recipe? Call us because we can help it get into the marketplace. So I said, well, we have a recipe. We have a bunch of sauces that we've been making at the restaurant that my mom and I have developed over the years. Let's see what this is about. So it turns out it's a very competitive class to get into. There was an interview. I got to talk to the director. She was super excited because she said, you have your own commercial kitchen. This program's going to be perfect for you. Um, you're in. So I signed up for this class. It's a 12-week, super intensive class. It's basically meant to squish three years of work into a 12-week course, where at the end of the course, you get to pitch to the buyer of a local grocery chain. And Mm -hmm. we started off everything from uh, like market research to uh, sourcing your ingredients to um, making a label to finding out how wow. how you want like which sauces or what you want because we had people in the class who not only had sauces but one of my best friends now she made a kefir water a sparkling kefir water and then we had somebody who was making caramel so it was a very diverse class of entrepreneurs from all over the field. And we were just there to learn. And it was super useful. And I say to this day, it was the best investment that we ever made. I think the cost was $2,000 and it was a lot of money to spend, right? On something that we had the payoff. (laughs) But it was just learning so much from that class. And we went through that class and I pitched, that was our final and um, instead of just coming with just the sauces for people to taste with a spoon, my mom and my husband, Calvin, were saying, well, people don't just eat sauce out of the jar. Mm-hmm. You have <laughs> yeah. to try it with something because it'll taste different. And so my mom actually made fried rice with our hot chili sauce mixed with our hoisin sauce. My husband smoked some ribs and glazed it with mm-hmm. the hoisin sauce. Um, we fried some chicken wings and tossed it with the peanut sauce, and that's how we served it to the buyers. I didn't have any bottles ready. I um, just double-sided taped um, labels that I printed off from my printer and just showed them what I think and I hope that it's going to be. But look, taste the sauce. And I got to tell them our story and share with them our recipes. And they loved it. And we were actually the very first company to go through this course to have gotten into all 18 locations. And so (laughs) that put our foot in the door. And that was an amazing experience. And that's how it all started. (laughs) That is that is wild, because like, what? um, I don't know if it's fate or just, you know, how how life works out for you. But you you definitely went down to the small business, you said chamber, right? Or commerce Mm -hmm. area. Yeah. For something else. And then that totally just presented itself in front of you. And you got to be part of this crazy accelerator program that has been so fruitful for you guys. That's just amazing. And um, you guys are now um, available online, obviously, and Mm -hmm. in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Are you guys available um, nationally as well? So we are in talks right now. I can't give anything away, but there's some exciting things happening um, that we're working on and things have been moving really fast. So that's been a blessing from being closed during this remodel is that I've had a chance to focus more on our retail line. And, um, it's been, it's been really exciting and I just, oh, we're so excited I can't wait for to you. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, tell me about, so you were obviously pregnant then. Were, were you pregnant when you were going through all this, the accelerator? I, I wasn't pregnant at the time. My kids had just turned one. So oh, okay. I was so still was nursing, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it was after. And, um, you know, it was just one of those things where I was still working. Our restaurant in Vancouver was still operating and my mm-hmm. mom was still running the Beaverton location. And my mom, funny enough, was not supportive at the time. <laughs> Um, you know, she was just like, it's a pipe dream because, you know, the immigrant mentality is you just never know what's going to happen the next day. And Mm -hmm. being in the restaurant, you get a paycheck every single day. And with CPG, especially food CPG, your margins are so low. You really have to look towards scaling and we have no experience in CPG or, 
you know, retail or anything like that. So my mom was always thinking that this is just a side hustle. And I would kind mm-hmm. of have to evade her by telling her, oh, I'm doing something else. But really, it's to focus on the sauce. Right. Um, and so whether it be demoing or just um, having a meeting with a buyer or talking with my mentors, my mom would always just say, your head's in the clouds, like come back down to earth and, you know, the restaurant is where the money's at. And um, that's, but then the sauces kind of took up, took off really fast. And um, it got to the point where at the, at the time we had customers who came to us and asked us if we would, if we were interested in selling our location in Vancouver, they knew that our family lived in Beaverton Mm -hmm. They knew that the drive was very far. They knew that I was a new mom and, um, you know, we built up a really great uh, customer base in Vancouver and they saw it as a great business opportunity. And it just came at a place where we hadn't even ever thought about selling, but because they approached us, I think it just gave me this freedom to say yes Please mm-hmm. buy the restaurant. Yeah. And then, Take it off my hands. Yes. And I mean, we were very profitable, but I just couldn't handle and juggle everything very well at the same time. I mean, yeah, it's difficult um, yeah. to be a working mom and, and to a working mom of twins, no less. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, even though you, you have this village around you supporting you, your husband, your family, it's still difficult, right? Especially when you're working on something that you're just pouring your heart into to try and build and and be bigger mm-hmm. than you you ever dreamed, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's amazing. And then yeah. um, after you did that, did you feel like a sense of relief, like in terms of like oh, I've freed up some amount of time, I can be a better or a more present mom, perhaps um, initially more present business owner. Initially, no, because my mom had thought that I would come right back to the Beaverton location (laughs) and take over for her so that she could have some more time off. But I really, really begged her, please, please give me a year. I just want to see where this sauce is going to go. Please just let me do this. And she grudgingly said yes, but she (laughs) made me literally write it down that I would be back after a year. And that like a binding happen. contract? It was. It was like a binding contract that we both wrote down. It was on a back of a old, you know, an old envelope, a bill, like an envelope for a bill or something. And I still yeah. have it because they wrote down exactly what would happen <laughs> when I come back. My mom would work this amount of time. My dad would work this amount of time. I would take over this. So it's it's just one of those funny things. But, you know, I just saw the potential and my husband really believed in it. Um, and so he was like, he also helped me a lot by saying, do what you need to do. I'll help you take care of the kids and, um, just let's see how far we can take this. And my husband was a great sounding board. We initially launched the products as vegan certified because I was Mm -hmm. vegan at the time. And so it was really important for me to certify them as vegan. And then just through the demo process, you know, We got a lot of feedback about people who were uh, gluten sensitive or had celiac and, Mm -hmm. you know, just bouncing off my husband. Is this something that we should do? It's a lot of money to get certification, but he's very even keeled, whereas I'm very emotional. And he was like, you know, just if you think this is what you need to do, just do it. And we just don't look back. So I think we balance each other in that way. Yeah, I was going to say that's perfect that you have that dynamic because, you know, imagine doing somebody, some business with somebody just like you. Um, (laughs) Like my mom. It would be difficult to make those decisions, right? So it's great that you have that. And then, you know, like, that's crazy. So that was like five years ago, right? Because your twins are now six. Is that right? So they're now six. They just turned six. Um, And so when we graduated the program, they were turning two. And so it's been about Mm -hmm. four years. Yeah. And Oh my um, God, what a journey. It has been a journey. And I think it's so fun to be able to include them in it as well. Um, My husband will oftentimes take them out to where I'm demoing. If I'm doing a fun (gasps) demo, they can come out and see. 
Or when we go to the store and they see, you know, the sauce on the shelf and they'll be like, it's mommy's sauce. And they're just so excited. And I really yeah, love being so able to amazing. share it with them. Yeah. I know. That is so amazing. I think, um, you know, as parents, it's our responsibility to to model what is possible for our children, right? And I think that you are, you're just an amazing example of like, running with something and building it and growing it and you know your kids are like witness to it which is it makes it even more magical right thank you i mean do you reflect on that and you're just like like what's been your biggest wow moment so far in this whole journey i think the biggest wow moment was the very first time we went to safeway and we saw mm-hmm. the sauces on the shelf and they were like at prime like eye level, they had a sticker on it that said women owned local. Oh my God, I love it. Right? (laughs) And so, and my kids were with me. I just felt this sense of just, I don't know. I just felt really emotional because of all the sacrifices that we had done. Mm -hmm. I missed out on a lot of bedtimes. I missed out on a lot of, you know, family time to be able to go out and demo these sauces and, yeah. Um, to share the sauces with everyone. And, you know, it brought a lot of conflict between my mom and I. But I think at that time when I saw it at a store that she recognized that she doesn't necessarily shop at because she says Safeway is too expensive for her, <laughs> but at a shop that she actually knew because up until then we've been in more specialty shops or more, mm-hmm. um, you know, more gourmet type stores. Um, that yeah. she never shopped at. So it didn't really mean much. But hearing that it was in Safeway and Albertsons, that kind of, even though she's never yeah. said that she's been proud of me, but she said, oh, <laughs> I saw your sauces at the at the store the other day. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah, those are national names. And, and that, you know, your story just right there is so... I would say typical of, of an Asian parent. It's like you bring home your A and they're like, well, where's your A plus? Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> like what were you really doing? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I'm sure you're going to, we can't wait for what's in store for you because I think, you know, your journey is really only beginning and I'm looking forward to hearing more big news um, that's you. on the horizon. Thank that's you. Oh, just so amazing. And I, <laughs> I love that that piece that you mentioned about the sticker and the tag saying that it was woman owned and they recognize that like mm-hmm. it's so important um, these days, especially with, you know, everything that that has come to light um, in the past year plus with all the inequalities and the injustices. And, you know, I think things like these are showing that we're making progress because I could tell you 20 years ago, if I you know, rolled into a grocery store, there would not have been that type of marketing. There would not have been that type of inclusion. And I hope you feel proud of of what you're doing and, and how you're a change maker in that regard. It's Thank it's a beautiful you. story. I feel particularly very fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Particularly with all the sacrifice that that we know, you know, your parents made and um our parents of this generation made for us um mm-hmm. to have this this better life. So that's so lovely. <laughs> I love your story. Thank you. Um, Thank you for giving yeah. me this like opportunity to share and for elevating yeah. the voices like mine or other women or BIPOC women, especially yeah. um, who don't necessarily really have that opportunity to share our stories. Yeah. And this is what Dear Asian Americans is all about. So we are happy to have you on. And, you know, with that said, we, we usually close every episode with a, with a love letter, I would say, to the community. <laughs> um, so if you would please, I would love for you to take us out with your um, love letter to the community. Yeah, Dear Asian Americans, your sacrifices have, are so important and they're so appreciated and we are grateful for the sacrifices that you've made. But also, please enjoy the moment that we're in. Please enjoy the life that you've built. Um, your accomplishments, big or small, are amazing what you've been able to achieve with the obstacles and the challenges that you've experienced in the past. And just thank you. I love that. I think... Um... 
You're right on point there. Sometimes we don't stop to smell the roses, so to speak, or to even acknowledge how far we've come. Um, And I think that's a great message to end this episode with. So thank you so much for your time again, Lisa. And we can't wait. uh, Yeah, we can't wait for what's to come for you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. That was an amazing story. I want to thank Lisa for sharing her story. And I want to thank our guest host for March on the Ears of Americans, Tiffany Huang, for making time to share and, and have the interview with Lisa. Uh, my name is Jerry, the regular host and the creator of the Ears of Americans. And if you're joining us for the first time, I want to thank you. I'm Tracy Nguyen Meng, and thank you for helping us preserve history. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And please take a moment to rate us and provide us feedback. And if you have a story to share, contact us at stories at vietnameseboatpeople.org.